everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Heidelberg Astronomical Colloquium. It is a special pleasure to welcome uh, Vernisa Smolcic from the University of Zagreb. She will be talking about black holes and what we can learn about black hole formation evolution from radio observations with the uh, VLA and with other instruments, in particular in the cosmos uh, field, in the cosmos deep field. Before we start with the talk, uh, let me say a few words about the speaker. Um, she comes from Zagreb, did uh, part of her master's thesis in Princeton, from that she moved to Heidelberg. I think she's well known to many of you from her PhD work up at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy here. From that she moved uh, to a place which has better weather than us, um, to Caltech. From that she moved back to Europe, then uh, was working at the Agelada Institute in Bonn, uh, at the Alma Arc, and uh, in 2010, while she was working in Bonn, she got appointed uh, assistant professor at the University of Zagreb, and since 2015 she is their associated professor. Um, she has won a number of very prestigious prizes that brought her to different places in the world. For instance, she was in Perth on a visiting uh, professorship a while ago, but the most prestigious prize she got was the uh, ESC starting grant on looking at precisely the topic she is talking about today, the properties of black holes as seen in the radio at different wavelengths. So, I will shut up and open the podium to Vanessa. Welcome. Thank you very much, Cheryl, for the introduction. And um, good afternoon to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be giving the talk here, especially at um, the place where I have graduated, where I have done my PhD. It feels a bit like coming home. So before I start talking about um, what insights on supermassive black holes in galaxies through cosmic time we can get from radio, I want to credit my collaborators that have done a lot of work that I'll be presenting during the talk. And in particular, this is Mladen Novak sitting in the audience. Um, who just recently graduated at the University in Zagreb and moved here to the Max Planck for his postdoc. My PhD student Lana Tserai and postdoc Ivan Del Vecchio, as well as Jacinta Del Hayes, my postdoc at the University of Zagreb, as well as Eva Schinner here at the Max Planck Institute, who has contributed a lot to the radio service in the cosmos field and the work I'll be presenting, and the collaborators in Italy. So, this is the outline of my talk and I will start with basically an extensive introduction into what we actually observe um, in the radio band when we observe AGN and how this fits into the picture of galaxy formation and evolution. And then I will talk about the VLA Cosmos project, the galaxy populations that we actually pick out in the project, and finish with the cosmic evolution of radio AGN, outer redshift of close to six, and implications for the so-called radio mode feedback invoked in cosmological models. So let's start off with the introduction. And here I'm showing a general slide about our current picture, summarized knowledge about galaxy formation and evolution. By now, we know that there's two main galaxy population, populations, the red sequence galaxies and the blue cloud galaxies, which are different in many ways. The red sequence galaxies are spheroidals of early type with very little star formation, and the blue cloud galaxies are disk galaxies with um, high amounts of gas and abundant star formation. And we think that the evolution of galaxies actually can be nicely summarized through such a plot showing the galaxy color and the stellar mass, where blue galaxies actually 
evolve through some processes that are still currently to be understood in detail from the blue cloud to the red sequence. And this certainly happens via conversion of gas within the galaxies into stars, via passive fading of stars via galaxy mergers, and it is aided by AGN feedback. And one of the key questions to answer and explore is what is actually the impact of AGN onto galaxy evolution. So to talk about this a bit more from the perspective of semi-analytic models, um, I'm showing here a slide about AGN feedback that is by now very regularly invoked in semi-analytical models. And in particular, they invoke two types of feedback called quasar mode feedback and radio mode feedback. So the quasar mode is often referred to as the truncation mode. It is merger driven and it is actually connected to quasar winds that expel a fraction of the gas from the galaxy and thereby terminate the star formation phase of the galaxy. So the galaxy can fade towards red colors. And this particular mode is not necessarily linked to radio emission that a galaxy would show. The second mode regularly invoked is called the radio mode or often the maintenance mode. And the idea behind that is that once a galaxy forms enough mass and a hot static halo forms around the galaxy, that modest accretion onto the supermassive black hole causes radio jets that then in turn heat the surrounding medium and thereby do not allow the gas to gravitationally collapse and form further stars and in outcome this leads to the truncation of stellar mass growth in the galaxy. And the combination of these two types of feedback actually allows these models to um, reproduce the observed galaxy properties. And in particular, here is shown a plot from the Croton et al. 2006 model, semi-analytic model, where the k bent luminosity function is shown, data are shown by the points, and this is essentially equivalent to the stellar mass function of galaxies. So the model predictions are the lines and without radio mode feedback included in the model one sees that the model highly over predicts the high mass end of the stellar of the stellar mass function while when agn heating radio heating is included the reproduction of the data is very good and in particular in the same model um, this plot from the same paper shows the supermassive black hole accretion rate accretion rate density as a function of redshift in the simulation and in particular the source population in the model responsible for radio heating is represented by these, this blue curve. This model was updated in 2016 um, it's called the SAGE model and it assumes a slightly more sophisticated um, accretion and heating process than previously and it assumes spherical accretion of Bondi Hoyle type onto the supermassive black holes where then the luminosity of the supermassive black hole assumed to be related with the accretion rate in the standard way using the standard 10% efficiency is taken as the source of heating that offsets the energy losses of the cooling gas. Whether this really happens in reality is still an open question. Whether this happens in reality on such a statistically significant level is still an open question. And it can be observationally tested. However, this is fairly challenging. And first, um, one needs to have more than several requirements ready before one can attempt to test whether this is happening in reality as assumed in the model based on data. So firstly, a radio survey, which is a combination of 
um, a deep radio survey over a large enough part of the sky is needed and this is to be able to sample statistically relevant samples of faint radio sources which are in the population thought to be responsible for this process. Secondly, excellent multivalent coverage needs to be present um, in the survey which allows to determine precise redshifts for the sources in the survey and as I will talk extensively later about it allows also to provide an efficient radio AGN identifier within the sample. And then once these requirements are set, one can use the radio data to derive luminosity functions, model the evolution of the luminosity functions of radio AGN, and then constrain the radio mode luminosity density as a function of redshift, which then is related to the supermassive black hole accretion rate through the assumed relation in the model. And before I will talk about our newest results on this topic based on the VLA Cosmos survey, I will spend some time discussing radio AGN in general. So what do we know about radio AGN? Um, mainly from studies at redshift below one. In general, what we observe in the radio band, which is usually at megahertz or gigahertz wavelengths, so 20 centimeter wavelengths or 10 centimeter wavelengths, is synchrotron emission arising within the galaxies. So um, this means it's relativistically accelerated particles spiraling through magnetic fields, which usually show a power, law, a power law spectrum of this form. There are two main processes in galaxies that can cause synchrotron radiation that we observe in the radio, and these are star formation related, where the charged particles get accelerated by supernova explosions, and processes related to the accretion onto supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies in forms of radio jets that are being formed um, arising from the galaxy. Um, when going through the radio literature, it can get a bit confusing because there are so many different classifications of radio sources. So I will, I will, I will briefly go through these um, trying to summarize them and simplify them as much as possible. So, suggested classifications were based, some of them are based on radio morphology into the two types called Fanner of Riley type 1 and type 2. So, if one has a radio galaxy um, resolved in the radio, then Depending on the luminosity distribution, one can divide the two types between the FR1 and the FR2 types. The FR1 types are mostly luminous in the inner part of the galaxy and FR2s in the outer part of the galaxy. Based on the radio spectrum, there's um, classifications such as steep flat, compact steep, source, um, compact steep sources, uh, gigahertz peak sources. Radio loudness is a widely used classification of sources and it is also a bit confusing um, in the literature because it has many various definitions. Sometimes radio loudness is based simply on a radio luminosity cut. Sometimes it is based on a chosen cut in a ratio of radio luminosity to the flux or luminosity in another band which may be optical or infrared, monochromatic, or integrated. And one of the most commonly used method to select AGN is via optical spectroscopy. So based on optical spectroscopy of the host galaxy that um, is observed to show jets in the case of radio AGN. So here I'm showing the basis of this. This is the so-called BPT diagram, suggested by Baldwin, Phillips and Terlevich already in 81. And the idea behind it is that emission line ratios can be used 
to separate star forming galaxies from various types of AGN as shown here. Um, and in particular the division can be made into so-called high excitation radio AGN and low excitation radio AGN. Where in the nomenclature also very commonly used Seifert's and quasars, both type 1 and type 2, would fall in the high excitation radio AGN category and liners and absorption line galaxies, elliptical galaxies, would fall in the low excitation radio AGN category. Now, there have been shown fundamental differences between these two types of AGN, high and low excitation radio AGN. And here I'm showing results from an analysis where SDSS and VSS lower achieved galaxies have been, have been analyzed with good spectroscopic data that allowed the separation into high and low excitation radio AGN. So it turns out that when one looks at the color of the host galaxies of these two types of AGN, the low excitation radio AGN have redder colors than the high excitation radio AGN. When one looks at the stellar masses of the host galaxies, again, it turns out that the low excitation radio AGN have an average higher stellar masses than the high excitation radio AGN. Using a proxy for black hole mass, it again turns out that the host galaxies of low excitation radio AGN contain more massive supermassive black holes than those of high excitation radio AGM. Yet, when one looks at proxies for the accretion rate onto those supermassive black holes, it turns out that it's the opposite, that the accretion rate in units of Eddington is on average lower for low excitation radio AGM. Meaning that low excitation radio AGM basically have more massive, supermassive black holes, but the accretion rate is uh, much smaller than for high excitation radio AGN. Furthermore, in a study done by Evans et al. 2006, they looked at X-ray observations of the nuclear regions of a sample of 22 3CRR radio galaxies, also local, and divided them into two types, FR2 and 1, where in their sample or all FR2s are high excitation radio AGN and FR1s low excitation radio AGN. So what they find is that the nuclear X-ray emission is dominated by heavily absorbed components for high excitation radio AGN and this they interpret as being consistent with a putative torus around the black hole and conclude that it's likely that it's radiatively efficient accretion that is ongoing in those sources which is surrounded by a putative dust torus. They find different results for their low excitation radio AGN where they find that their nuclear emission is unabsorbed and correlates with the radio emission of the cores, suggesting that the X-ray emission that they observe in those sources is actually of jet origin as well as the radio emission. And from this they, they conclude that the accretion flow is sub-Eddington and at low radiative efficiencies. So one can add another line into the difference between the high and low excitation radio AGN in terms of radiatively efficient and inefficient accretion flows. Another study by Ellen et al. 2006 um, where they looked at Chandra observations of um, extra luminous ellipticals. So they looked at um, the extra observations of these ellipticals and estimated jet powers from the bubbles inflated by the radio lobes in this emission and bondy accretion rates from a combination of the X-ray, 
data and black holes that they inferred from the velocity dispersions that, had, that they had available from the data. So correlating these two properties, they found a correlation which they interpreted as spherical bond accretion providing a reasonable description of the accretion onto supermassive black holes in ellipticals. Just as a reminder, ellipticals here are the equivalent of low excitation radio AGN. And furthermore, a year later, Hardcastle et al. suggested actually that also the phase, the gas phase that is being accreted on the, onto the supermassive black holes may be different that low excitation radio AGN accrete from the hot gas phase, while high excitation radio AGN accrete from the cold gas phase. And just to show a slide um, about the theory theoretical background of the accretion onto supermassive black holes, at Eddington ratios of about 1 to 10 percent, the um, thin disk structure in AGN is thought to be changing into a geometrically thick disk that is optically thin. Um, and these type of AGN, so these sub-Eddington accretors, are in the category of radiatively inefficient accretion flows. So the geometry around the black hole is also different than for the thin disk accretors. So to summarize all of this, many studies looking at the radio properties of AGN have led to the conclusion that there is essentially two fundamentally different types of AGN that you are seeing in the radio band. And one category that has many different names, high excitation radio AGN, thin disk AGN, radiatively efficient accretion flows, is in the category of the typically known AGN, where we have a central supermassive black hole in um, the galaxy surrounded by a geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk, and the structure is surrounded by a dusty torus. We have broad and narrow emission lines, and sometimes in these structures, radio luminous collimated jets occur. This is the unified model for AGN. But on the other hand, only in the radio band can we detect different types of AGN, which again have many different names, low excitation radio AGN, thick disk AGN, radiatively inefficient accretion flows, um, with, for example, optical spectra completely devoid of emission lines and detectable only essentially in the radio band. Their geometrical structures around the black holes are thought to be puffed up disks, which are geometrically thick, optically thin. Possibly the dust torus is missing, um, is missing within the structure as well. So, just to summarize a bit more, these two types of AGN show fundamental differences in many properties such as radio luminosity, optical color, stellar mass, gas mass, supermassive black hole mass, the modes of accretion, and as well cosmic evolution. And how one can summarize this um, in the plot that I have already shown in a different context, the color versus stellar mass plot, where the stellar mass increases towards the left, is um, shown here. As spectroscopically, based on the STSS and VSS first sample, sources have been divided into low and high excitation radio AGN, and it is clear that the low excitation radio AGN essentially occupy the red sequence of galaxies, while high excitation radio AGN occupy the green valley in this diagram. And one thing I want to particularly emphasize here is that star formation rate is increasing approximately in this direction, in this diagram. And this is important because, as I have shown, the source of radio emission may be star formation processes or AGN-related processes. And unless one has excellent morphologically resolved radio observations of every single source, 
it is impossible, um, not impossible, but very difficult actually to um, really determine the source of the radio emission in that particular galaxy, in that particular galaxy. So, in another study, based on the STSS and NVSS sample, what we have looked into is the source of radio emission in such optically selected galaxies based on optical spectroscopy. So again, spectroscopically we divided the galaxies into the standard classes with high excitation radio AGN and low excitation radio AGN. And we have estimated the star formation rates within the sample based on SED fitting. So based on the photometry avail available for the galaxy. And compared this for the various populations with the 1.4 gigahertz luminosity, which is a star formation ray tracer, meaning that any offset of a galaxy from the one to one line, uh, well, from um, the correspondence line here, calibrated for star forming galaxy, means that compared to the expected radio emission, arising from the star formation rate in the host galaxy, there is additional radio emission. And then we looked at the average offset for particular galaxies to estimate what the statistical fractions of star formation rate contributions and AGN contributions to the observed radio luminosity may be. As expected for such star forming galaxies, we find per definition that there is 100% of star formation contribution. And what we find is that for Seaford type of galaxies, there is actually a comparable contribution to the observed radial luminosity from star formation re related processes in the host galaxy and AGN related processes. While for low excitation radio AGN, the radial luminosity is highly dominated by AGN related processes. And this is consistent with other results based on other radio surveys. So, to conclude this part of the talk, it is thought that radio AGN are um, the population responsible for so-called radio mode feedback, which, at least in semi-analytic models, is the key process that controls the stellar mass buildup of massive galaxies in the universe. Um, yet, from an observational perspective, it's still poorly understood if, on such a stati statistically significant level, this is happening. There are two fundamentally different types of radio AGN, which have many different names, and these are the radiatively efficient ones, which would consist of Seaford, Quasar, high excitation radio AGN categories, and they have, they accrete at around Eddington um, ratios, Ed Eddington luminosities. And the radiatively inefficient ones often refer to low excitation radio AGN, which accrete at highly sub-Eddington ratios. And in the radio band, we observe the unified model AGN that we would expect, but we also observe um, the low excitation radio AGN, which can be observed only through the radio band, but unless one has superb radio data, which is currently impossible to obtain for large deep surveys, one big, the biggest complication is that the source of radio emission within the galaxy can actually arise from star formation related processes rather than AGN related processes. So, having introduced this, I will now switch to the BLA Cosmos 3 GHz large project and our results based on this survey. So, the BLA Cosmos 3 GHz project is a um, um, project conducted with a very large array where we received close to 400 hours of observations towards the Cosmos field which we then observed at 3 gigahertz and the image at a resolution of 0.75 arc seconds and we reach 
an RMS of 2.3 microgens kiss per beam and detect close to 11,000 sources, which to date really makes um, the survey simultaneously the largest and deepest over such a field at such a resolution. Um, just to show a bit of details on the calibration and imaging, we used a pipeline for the reduction in the end, but it was just a first step um, after which we did imaging through a lot of testing, a lot of um, encountering a lot of challenges. It took us probably, I think, close to four years to get through the data reduction and all of the challenges that we um, encountered through the process. So, in the end, we taper to a resolution 0.75 times 0.75 square arc seconds. And to show the final mosaic, I love sh showing the, the radio mosaics because after four years of work, <laughs> in the end, the radio maps always look like a black square with not too many sources. So, let me zoom in a bit. This is one of my favorite galaxies, a wide angle tail radio galaxy close to the center of the field. Um, and then a part of the field with big galaxies, but also point sources and a larger area of the field where mostly point sources are visible. So, um, the particular advantage of these observations is that the RMS is um, not only very low, but it is also uniform across the field. It is 2.3 microgenskis per beam over the cosmos to square degree field. And to extract the catalog, we use the blobcat codes, combined multiple components into sources, such as the big radio galaxies. And in the end, we ended up to close to 11,000 sources above 5 sigma. We did a lot of tests on quality assessment um, to assure ourselves that the astrometry fluxes are fine, that we have the completeness um, in control, completeness corrections and such. And let me also point out that all the data of the VLA Cosmos survey um, that I'll be presenting today is also publicly available. I haven't included the, li the link, but through the IPEC IRSA site, one can find all of the catalogs. So to put the VLA Cosmos 3 gigahertz project in context, I'm showing here depth versus area for many radio surveys conducted, where basically past surveys um, are shown here by the green and the gray dots. Future surveys that are currently planned only are shown by the, bl uh, by the blue dots. And obviously, one wants to aim to the deepest survey possible, constraining the largest part of the sky possible. And the VLA Cosmos survey in this context is really bri bridging the past to the future. And in context on sensi of sensitivity, this means that in terms of radial luminosity as a function of redshift, there are various survey depths are shown here, and the various cuts for various galaxy population are shown by the horizontal lines. So when one looks at the 3 gigahertz survey and in the context of low power radio AGN, one is basically sensitive to the low, even to the low power radio AGN out to the highest redshifts. So to summarize, we have close to 11,000 sources over two square degrees, and this is um, simultaneously the largest and deepest radio survey at such a good angular resolution. So let me go next on to the galaxy populations that we find in the VLA Cosmos survey, as this is very important in the sense of identifying radio AGN that we can then use to track the cosmic evolution of radio AGN. So, as I have shown previously in the lower redshift universe, it is possible and commonly adopted then that one uses spectroscopic tools to separate um, the, the radio sources into AGN, into various types of AGN and star-forming galaxies. But in deep 
surveys such as the cosmos where the I band magnitudes are fainter than 26 for example it is impossible um, to have spectroscopic observations uh, for every single galaxy that one could apply such a method at high redshift. So the commonly used criteria for higher redshift radio sources are usually a combination of various multi-wavelength diagnostic tools that would allow one to select various types of AGM. And these are often based on X-ray infrared selected AGN based on restrain optical colors which have been shown to relate to the position of the galaxy in the BPT diagram for example or the infrared radio correlation which is somehow equivalent to the radial loudness criterion. And in the cosmos field we have a lot of multi-wavelength data which allow us to do a very good assessment of the counterparts of our radio sources. We also have very accurate photometric redshifts, um, both for galaxies and for AGN, and we have a lot of spectra as well. So this is what we have done to classify as broadly as possible our radio sources in the VLA Cosmos survey. So for about 35% of the sources we have um, spectroscopic redshifts and photometric redshifts for the rest which are accurate. So first we combine the 11,000 sources within a smaller field of Cosmos 1.8 square degrees to the newest Cosmos catalog called Cosmos 2015 where sources have been detected from a stacked map in the Z, Y, J and K bands. Then we looked for the counterparts of our sources at different AGN criteria, the standard X-ray AGN criterion with the X-ray luminosity higher than 10 to the 42 ergs per second, color-color diagrams identifying mid-infrared AGN and we performed also SED fitting on the full photometry available in more than 30 bands in the cosmos field, fitting also an AGN component um, and selecting AGN this way as well. So these objects we put in a category that we call moderate to high radial, radiative luminosity AGN which makes up about 2600 sources. For the remainder of the sources, we then looked at the rest frame colors of their host galaxies, which have been shown um, that they can be used in the sense that blue and green colors um, are consistent with star formation. We also put in the criteria if a galaxy is red in its rest frame colors but has a Herschel detection, we also consider it to be a star forming galaxy. And the red galaxies are essentially the red sequence galaxies, so quiescent galaxies with little star formation, yet obviously detected in the radio band. So these are AGN. So these led to the next two categories of star forming galaxies and the different, the, the second category of AGN, which we call low to moderate radiative luminosity AGN. And all of these criteria now are basically based on the host galaxy properties and do not necessarily have to be related to the source of the radio emission in the particular source. So we defined another criteria, criterion that we call radio access. So we looked at the radio luminosity over star formation rate for every single galaxy where the star formation rate was obtained from the SED fitting. So if there existed an excess of radio emission compared to that expected for star formation processes within the host galaxy, independently computed, then we define it as a radio excess, obviously AGN, if we assume that there are two main sources for the radio emission. So to 
summarize this part, we combined the VLA data with the Cosmos multivaveling data set, which allows us to have statistically significant samples of star forming in the AGN galaxies out of a redshift of close to six. And we used many different criteria to, to identify star forming in the AGN galaxies uh, within the sample both based on the host galaxy properties and the radio emission of the galaxies, allowing to um, select the populations in different ways depending on the science case. And these catalogs with these classification criteria are also publicly available. So now with the source populations, um, we could go on assessing the cosmic evolution of the radio AGN that we have within our survey. So to come back to the classification, we decided that the cleanest sample to use for this purpose is the radio excess AGN sample, which as said was selected based on looking at the ratio of 1.4 gigahertz luminosity over star formation rate that was computed via SED fitting, so completely independent of radio emission. And it is not really constant with redshift, but for the entire population it increases a bit. So we defined a three sigma excess relative to, to the, the average of the population and defined everything that's above the three sigma line as the radio excess AGN. And then using the standard 1 over V max method and correcting for all sorts of incompletenesses that we had in the sample, we constructed the luminosity functions for the radio axis AGN in various bins out of redshift of 5.5. And this is quite a busy plot, so our results are shown by the black dots in every single panel. Every single panel shows a different redshift pin and all the points um, with different colors are essentially points from the literature from many various surveys that constrain the luminosity functions. So our results are based on close to 2000 radio AGN and um, the important things to point out here is that even though our field is two square degrees, so it's a small volume locally, um, we find good agreement with local luminosity functions. We also find excellent agreement with luminosity functions derived um, from thousands of square degrees, both locally and at a redshift of 0.5. And we're in reasonable agreement with the other deep surveys um, available in the literature. So assuming a fixed shape of the luminosity function um, based on the local luminosity function um, constrained using other data over many decades of luminosity, we then parametrized the evolution of the luminosity function in a simple model from low redshift to a redshift of close to six um, with two free parameters. And we modeled the two simple cases, pure luminosity evolution and pure density evolution, where the fixed luminosity function either travels only in the x-axis direction over redshift or only in the y-axis direction in the redshift. And this is because we do not constrain a large enough range in luminosity to be able to discriminate between uh, more complicated models than this. And then the next step of converting the modeled evolution of the luminosity functions into the black hole accretion rate density that I have shown at the beginning from the SAGE model is to convert the observed, uh, the radio luminosity that we compute from the observed 3 gigahertz fluxes into kinetic luminosity. And this is because um, 
the observed radial luminosity is essentially only a fraction of the entire luminosity contained in the jets and the lobes of the radio AGN. So one essentially wants to know the rate at which the radio AGN transfers energy to their environments and the observed radial luminosity is essentially only a proxy for this. And this is the most challenging and most uncertain bit of this full calculation as um, the errors, the uncertainties in this relation are quite high. So there's basically several approaches on how to correlate um, the, the radial luminosity at a certain frequency, so a monochromatic radial luminosity to the kinetic luminosity that is essentially inherent to the jets and lobes of the, AG, of the AGN. And one of them is based on mostly local observations of galaxy clusters um, where a strong AGN, um, radio AGN, radio galaxy exists in the center and high resolution X-ray data exist where it is visible that the lobes of the radio AGN inflate bubbles in the X-ray gas and from essentially uh, the internal energy of the bubbles and the work that needs to be done to inflate the bubbles um, to these sizes one can infer what the kinetic luminosity is and this has been first done by Birzan et al. 2004 and then many other studies have been added and these are the points shown here and when correlations are fit to these points um, they all have a similar slope of 0 0.7, 0 0.8 but the scatter in the data alone is quite large 0.6 or 0.7 dex. The other approach is through minimum energy arguments where Willot et al. calculated what the minimum energy stored in the lobes is needed to be to produce the observed synchrotron luminosity and taking all uncertainties into account they stored it in one parameter called the FW and estimating the uncertainty parameter between 1 and 20. Now when one compares the various approaches the Villot et al. method for FW15 is approximately in normalization close to the level of the results based on the X-ray studies. So picking one of these correlations and converting now the radial luminosity at 1.4 gigahertz into the kinetic luminosity, one can constrain the kinetic luminosity density as a function of redshift. And here are um, the results based on the COSMOS survey, where we show the full extent of the possibilities based on the range of, of the um, uncertainty of the relation of the conversion between the two luminosities. So for FW4, the results are shown by the blue and the red lines here for the pure luminosity and density evolutions. If FW were 15, for the pure luminosity evolution, it would only shift the curve up because the normalization is higher and then the full extent of FW1 is shown here and FW20 is shown up here. And just as a reminder, using the relation between accretion rate and luminosity as assumed in the Croton et al. models, this is equivalent, these curves are equivalent to the ones I have shown at the beginning from the semi-analytic model of Croton et al. And in the model um, the green line is here from the model. So even though there's still large systematic uncertainties, there actually is an astonishing agreement between the derived curve and the one assumed in the model. And if one were to take the FW15 
value which matches the x-ray the results from the x-ray studies as possibly the most likely relationship then the results would actually indicate that there is even more kinetic luminosity available than required in this particular SAGE model, Croton 2060. How much more time do I have? Okay, I do not need more. So just in the last few minutes, let me um, show you our preliminary results, what we are currently working on. Um, so far, we've used the radio access sample and it is possible that um, in the galaxies also present within this region there is some AGN emission that we have not accounted for at the moment because we had this rough threshold above which we defined our sample. It is also possible that these galaxies, our radio access AGN, have a certain contribution of star formation within their host galaxy in the radio emission. So we are currently working on a statistical method to essentially from every single galaxy subtract the radio luminosity fraction that arises from the star formation rates in the host galaxy. So for this we took the full sample um, and assumed that the radio luminosity that we derived from, derived from our observed fluxes is arising from the contributions of star formation related and AGN related processes. And in essence, we know the star formation rates of the host galaxies through SED fitting, so independently of radio, and through the radio luminosity star formation rate calibration, that I will not go into detail now, we can estimate the radio luminosity expected for that star formation rate. Then we can subtract it from the radio, from the total radio luminosity we get for our source and we're left with the radio AGN contribution only. The radio AGN fraction associated with every single galaxy. I will skip over this and using this method, this statistical method of essentially subtracting the star formation related luminosity, we again derived the luminosity functions. And this is work done by Lana Cera et al. So when we construct the total luminosity function, taking all of our sources into account, we get the red points. And this statistical method um, is supposed to subtract the star formation component of it. And as you see in the red points, there's always this bump occurring at low luminosities. And this is exactly the bump that occurs from the star forming galaxy luminosity function, which starts dominating at these luminosities. So the black points here are our results after the subtraction of the star formation fraction to the radial luminosity is done and as expected it lowers this bump um, bringing the luminosity functions down only to the AGN, the radio AGN related part. And then to this sample, to these luminosity functions, we fitted the two parameter model as we did previously, use the same conversions to get to the kinetic luminosity and shown here are the results. This is the same plot as previously. We're now the different method for FW equals four is shown here by the orange and green, oh sorry, orange and red, and red lines. And we see that now the shape has changed a little bit and the evolution at lower redshift is not as steep as it was before compared to the blue line, the results previously, and maybe even more consistent with what is inherent to the Croton et al. model. So I would conclude here that the kinetic energy exerted by radio AGN might be high enough to balance the radiative cooling of the hot gas since a redshift of five, but I would definitely stress 
that there are still so many simpl simplifications inherent to both the observational calculation, particularly this um, calibration to get from luminosity, um, monochromatic luminosity to kinetic luminosity, as well as in semi-analytic models to be confident about really the validity of this. And I would conclude with this here and I would leave you with my full summary. Thank you very much. Many thanks for this very nice review and overview of what we can learn by combining many wavelengths observations about black hole evolution throughout the cosmic history. So um, the podium is open for discussions and questions. Who would like to start? So we start with Nadine. And I get my exercise. Thank you. Um, I have a question related to the first part of the talk with the low excitation and high excitation radio AGN. And my question is whether there may be some physical connection between the two, whether it's an evolutionary connection, because you showed that they lie on the red sequence and the green valley. And um, a follow-up question is whether you also see radio AGN in the blue cloud or whether it's totally a void of radio AGN. Excellent, um, excellent questions. So, uh, first about the evolution. So, I think it is tempting to um, think that there actually might be an evolutionary connection because the separation is really um, into the green valley versus red sequence. However, I think one needs to first consider why and how the radio jets are expected to be formed. Um, and if um, we assume that um, the rotational energy of the black hole as assumed in the blanford Zneig mechanism um, is the main source that feeds um, the jets, then I think the difference may arise mainly from the geometry of um, the surrounding of the black hole, where it's simply more likely that a jet will be formed if one has a puffed up geometry um, rather than a thin disk. Because in the model, um, the kinetic luminosity is proportional to the poloidal magnetic field, which is proportional to the height of, um, of, of the disk. So it may be rather that this effect drives um, the fact that the two um, seem separated, but um, that it's actually more likely that a jet will be formed in, in red sequence galaxies rather than the green cloud and that the distinction um, between the two populations might simply be um, because of the optical classification of the sources. And the additional effect is also related, I think, to the source of the radio emission, which turns out that in statistically looking half of the radio emission observed in high excitation radio AGN, which are green valley, may actually be arising from the star formation related processes rather than the AGN related processes. Um, the second question was related to... Okay, so statistically looking, the blue cloud galaxies are dominated by radio emission consistent with what one would expect from the star formation rate processes. Yet, I think that um, it would, it is likely that many of them could have also AGN components, um, also that shine up in the radio, but that they do not dominate the radio luminosity. And this becomes um, rather obvious when one looks at um, star forming blue cloud galaxies separated into disk galaxies only and those containing bulges. So those that contain bulges are more likely to have AGN-related radioluminosity. 
So next question from Nathan. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question about the last part. Uh, how confident are you uh, in transforming infrared into star forming uh, uh, rates? Because of uh, sometimes it can underestimate or overestimate star formation rate because of different reasons. Yes. Um, on a statistical basis, I think we're as confident as one can get with the methods used today. Um, which means that it is likely that uh, it is possible that due to, for example, so or to start off with, so we take the integrated infrared luminosity from the SED fitting that we then convert to star formation rates. So it is possible that in some galaxies we have um, dust that is heated through different processes than star formation contributing to this. But um, one of the reasons we decided to, um, to do the calculation this way is it's statistically robust on average and easier to compare with other results from the literature. Next question, Christian Fendt. Hi, I also have a question to the first part of your talk. So you were comparing uh, accretion modes and accretion rates for low and high excitation AGN. So for the modes you were applying um, a disk mod, you had a thick and thin disk model, while for the rate, accretion rate you were applying a Eddington luminosity, which is a spherical uh, geometry, so this is not really consistent, probably. Yeah? So why do not why don't the people apply? I mean, when they calculate uh, accretion rates, uh, disk uh, standard disk, for example, or yeah. that's that's um, an excellent question. I think the the answer to this one is that it's commonly adopted to normalize to Eddington units. So this is the reason for it. So, are there further questions? So, two, I start with Keith and then Sasha is next. So, um, I also have a question to the very first part of your talk, um, and that is related to this FR1 and FR2 uh, ge geometries. Um, when I was still uh, a long, long time ago, still thinking a bit about jet uh, geometries and, and hydrodynamics, then um, my picture at that time was that FR2s, they are low density jets that are being pumped into a high density environment, whereas uh, FR1s are high density jets that are pumped into a low density environment, and hence the different shapes. But uh, now it seems that the FR2 once uh, seems to be associated to very low activity or very low energies. Uh, so that seems to be exactly opposite to this picture. Is Or am I missing something? So the FR1, um, FR2 distinction versus low excitation versus high excitation distinction is not one to one. Um, I think this is probably in the basis of the answer to this question. Um, there is recently suggested a new class of objects which would be FR zeros. So one also has to um, be a bit careful what to compare in the sense that FR1s and FR2s that you're talking about are as large that they go beyond the galaxy. Per definition, those are FR1s and FR2s. The galaxies mostly observed in STSS and VSS sample and in samples like the Cosmos are galaxies which with presumable jets that do not reach out of the host galaxy. So they are um, to the first order order of lower size. So I wouldn't take the FR1 and the FR2 division strictly as one-to-one -to, -one, um, to the low and high excitation. I think it's quite different. Yeah, I, I had a question about the part where you actually explained how difficult it is to translate the radio luminosity to a kinetic luminosity. Because actually you showed that even for the galaxies that have been well analyzed, there's a huge scatter, and I was actually trying to understand what is driving this scatter. And so the only thing that I could come up with 
is time variability that they go. And so now we will show in your analysis that you've analyzed the most extreme access sources. And if you think that behind that there's very strong time variability, are you not biasing your results to those weird galaxies that are just happening to go through their most extreme phase of radio radioactivity? And how do you deal with that in the analysis? I think um, variability um, it should not be a big issue in the sample that we analyze because um, most of our AGN sample are very faint sources which I do not think um, are expected to show strong variability through the time. And this is very consistent with the fact that we obtain similar results when using our old 20 centimeter data taken in 2003 to 2005 compared to the current data taken 2012 to um, 2014, I think. Um, so um, this suggests that if any variability is important, it averages out in the sample that you're looking at. In terms of the correlation between the two luminosities, I think one of the biggest, well, one of the biggest, um, a big reason for the scatter is that one would not expect at all that this relation is a one parameter relation, that it depends only on the kinetic luminosity, uh, sorry, that it depends only on the monochromatic luminosity, but again, kinetic luminosity will certainly depend also of the age of the radio source as it changes as the radio source gets older um, and also grows in size and it will also depend on the environment that the, the environment um, around the galaxy that the radio jets jet is probing so more detailed hydrodynamical models are actually showing this so the scatter is largely due to these effects that are not constrained at the moment so with that, let's thank Vernisa for this fantastic talk she's giving. Thank you. Thank you.